make you sit back and think about your life. Now, being as such a big sports house as, uh, as I have, you know, you have a lot of those moments where you think about what am I putting my trust in as to reference the amount of uh, the amount of effort you put into following these sports and stuff compared to how much effort am I putting into the word. And I had one of those moments here this last week because uh, if any of you guys are, you're going to have to turn me way down. Um, if any of you guys follow the Thunder or just Oklahoma City basketball in general uh, near as much as I do, this last week has been a roller coaster of emotions, needless to say. Um, you know, first Saturday morning you wake up and Paul George has been traded, and then you wake up Monday and Jeremy Grant's been traded. Then you wake up later this week and now our cornerstone player, Russell Westbrook, has been traded. So there's a big, been a big low for, for Thunder fans in general this week. Um, not to mention all the rumors of everybody else that Sam Presti is looking at trading. But what it does, and it did for me this week, is it put me in check because I had to take a step back and go, okay, these players are getting traded from a sports team that I'm not going to stop following. And yet you get so emotional when you see some of these players leaving. Do you get that emotional whenever you read the word? Do we get that emotional whenever we wake up to come here on Sunday mornings, whenever we come to Wednesday Bible study or Thursday Bible study? Do we have those kind of emotions? Whether it's crying, whether it's excitement, joy, whatever emotions, but do we have those emotional swings? Or do we just kind of show up and, hey, we're going to listen to somebody teach and then we're going to write some notes down and then go home and, and be done with it. So, needless to say, my house has been an emotional roller coaster this week. Uh, and uh, uh, just mainly due to that, because, you know, I was talking to my wife a lot this week about it. And, and uh, you know, it's just, it's crazy how things, how things in life, if you'll stand back and look at events and go, wait a minute. Why? You know, eras, eras are temporary. God is eternal. Okay, we need, we run into issues of remembering that at times. Um, so, that's just a little, little side note of something that I, uh, I definitely had to deal with and learn, learn about this week. But a uh, funny uh, a funny note before I get started. I thought it was kind of funny whenever I got home Friday. Um, whenever we had heard that Dwayne was going to be gone these next couple weeks, me and Zach got together, and Zach was like, hey, do you want to teach one of them weeks? I'm like, yeah. So he's like, okay, well, you can teach the 14th. I'm like, cool. Well, due to being on call last weekend and not being here on Sunday, and then... Uh, I had a unit that it took me three days, and when I say three days, I had about uh, eight and a half hours of sleep from Tuesday morning to Thursday night, and uh, it uh, severely, severely tried to kick me in the butt, uh, and uh, it uh, it even had some guys that I've looked up to that's been doing this for 35 plus years, it had them stumped. And so, uh, so I wasn't here Wednesday night either. Hadn't been in a whole lot of contact with Zach this week. And so Friday, I get home at a decent time, um, which was actually on time. So I'm rolling into town about 4.30 or so. And uh, I roll by the pharmacy and I walk in there and I'm like, okay, am I still teaching Sunday? Because I have something. But I don't have any notes or nothing yet. And 
Zach's like, well, we hadn't talked, so I kind of started getting something together. So then we next, we spend the next 10 to 15 minutes telling each other, no, you can teach. No, you can teach. No, you can teach. We go back and forth for about the next 10 minutes. And then eventually it's like, all right, dude, I was planned. I got it. No big deal. Um, so, you know, I say that to say that, uh, you know, it's really cool to be a part of, of a couple guys that, you know, it's not, this, this ministry is not about us. And, and I have yet to have any situation to where I feel like either one of them or me is making it about us. Um, you know, this ministry is, is strictly centered around the Word of God, as it should be. But I always, between the feelings that we get with these two, you know, and uh, every great once in a while... You know, you guys have the uh, uh, either the privilege or the misfortune, whichever one you want to look at it, to uh, get to listen to me up here. You know, it's uh, it's it's really cool to be a part of this body. You know, especially after the first year or so, all three of us kind of looked at each other and was like, "Are we doing this right? Are we sure we're in the right position?" And it continues to manifest itself that. Hey, we might be we might be following God. It's just amazing whenever things like that happen. So, anyways, as we move into this, we bow your heads with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today, and I thank you for the opportunity to come up here to teach, and I thank you for this body. I thank you for the believers, Father, that that I come into contact with. I thank you for the opportunity to lean on other believers, Father, the kind of believers that are not ashamed of you when we get outside of these walls. Whenever we're in in hostile territory, so to speak, Father, that they're not afraid, that they walk with a reverence towards you, that they do not fear man, Father, but they fear you with an absolute reverence, Father. I pray that as we moved through today's message, that that reverence, if if we lack any of it, Father, that that something that we come into contact with today, that your Holy Spirit would come upon us, Father, and and show us what we're missing. Thank you, Father. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So my brothers have been before you with this series of fearing the Lord, you know, for the last couple weeks. You know, it's, it's, important, it's important to fear the Lord because of the reverence that comes with fearing Him. You know, remember that this fear has nothing to do with possible punishments that can force a person to follow. This is not a force kind of fear. Reverence is a show of absolute respect causing us to follow due to choice, not by being scared. But in order to have this reference, we got to fear the Lord. Oh, lost my place. How can we fear the Lord if we don't know who He is? You know, as a youth pastor, you know, every summer I hear from all the other, you know, youth pastors in town, we don't personally here yet have a camp that we go to um, and I emphasize yet um, but it's camp season you know for all the youth you know there's a lot of a lot of summer camps that whenever these kids come back especially when these youth come back I always like to spend the next Wednesday kind of quizzing them a little bit and, and seeing you know if they paid attention and if they paid attention how well did they pay attention And, you know, a lot of those camps really simplify everything and they, they teach salvation and knowing God, which is, which is great. We need to always revisit those kind of things. But I began thinking, you know, how often do we come back to the basics to check ourselves? You know, checking yourself can do major things to help, to help in your walk. Kind of sit, just like I said earlier, just taking a step back. And thinking, am I doing this right? 
you know, when you have a roller coaster of emotions, you check those emotions. What are those emotions over? You know, in order for the things that these guys have been up here teaching on fearing the Lord to work, we need to have and understand the love that God wants to give us. So I'm here today to kind of help us check ourselves a little bit, verify a couple things, you know, and I ask you, do you know the ultimate objective of the reverence you gain by following Christ? You know, God's love for us can show us so many things that it has the ability to teach us the answer to why we must fear him. You know, we're going to look at some examples here in a second of his love for us so that we can better understand the reverence we gain for him as we allow his grace to overcome our lives. You know, this love that he has for us, we need to have somewhat of an understanding of the love he has for us to understand how we are going to love him. You know, an example of having some of that reverence, I used the example of a marriage. Husbands, when you stand before your wives and you want an absolute reverence, this isn't due to you being a power hog and trying to lead your home in absolute power. That's not the way it should be, although that is the way we are shown. You've got to love her as Christ has required us to so that that reverence will naturally come out of both of you because if you are loving her as Christ tells us to, you are showing her reverence and in turn she can show you that reverence. She can show you that you are the man of the home. And trust me, when you're doing your job as a husband, there's a lot of things that go right inside the home. The main reason that brings that up is as I'm about to begin counseling, uh, begin counseling for a marriage that, you know, as I'm thinking of that and things, you know, that really ties into a reverence that we need to have for God whenever we begin to, to understand his love, begin to understand how to love him, because when we begin to love him, that reverence just naturally follows So we're going to begin in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. God did not give us He did not physically give us give birth to us. I always, you know, I kind of think of sometimes, I think of his love as almost as a step-parent's love, as a stepfather's love. He doesn't have to love us. He has everything that he needs. He doesn't have to, yet he steps in and says, follow me. I will be that father figure that you have lacked. In Psalms 86, 5, you, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. This doesn't say some who call to you. This is an all thing. It doesn't give us stipulations. It doesn't give us a list that we have to follow, some objectives that we have to have. Psalms 32, 10 and 11. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness, shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all who are upright in heart. 
And then we come to probably what is the is the most famous verse in the Bible with what is, in my opinion, the most left out version or verse of the Bible. John three sixteen and seventeen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You know, back in, back in Genesis, we have the example of Adam and Eve not following the one commandment they were given. And it's, it is the ultimate example of not doing something right. Because they literally only had one job. Their job was to care for the garden, not eat the fruit. And yet the only thing that God had told them not to do, they did it. And then he spends the entire rest of the Bible telling us of how much he loves us and how much he wants us to come back to him. The Father's love for us is so far out of our league so far out of spectrum that we there's no way we can put into perspective a level of effort that he puts into love for us. You know, if we've allowed that love to surround us and overcome us, then making a change into a mode of reference at his magnif- magnificence is part of the transformation of pursuing the salvation that he gives us. This reverence I talk about is where the fear comes in. You know, the fear, it doesn't become a frightening worry about your life kind of fear. You know, it turns into just an awe-creating feeling that causes us to do whatever we can not to disappoint God, not to, not to sin, not to, not to fall off the wagon, so to speak. We're so affixed on not disappointing Him that we are solely determined to do all that He tells us in the Word. We take the word for what it is. It's black letters on a white page. There is no gray area. So that, those are some examples of his love for us and some of the effort that he puts into love for us. You know, we can, we can stand up here, we can converse, and we can talk about his love for us all day long, but in our finite minds, there's no way, there's no way that we can fathom how much love is actually there. So the best way to understand some of the love that he has for us, just to stay in the word, understand the examples that are there. So then, once we understand what his love for us is, then we can start moving into understanding that this whole fear of the Lord that we keep talking about that we need to have, it isn't just understanding how to be scared of him or how to how to show him absolute reverence or absolute respect. It's just understanding how to begin to love him because that reverence and that fear comes behind. In Psalms 89.7, a God greatly feared in the counsel of the holy ones and awesome above all those who are around him. Hebrews 12, here's, you know, here's a lot of, there's a lot of examples of, in the word of just about everything that, uh, you know, that we teach up here. And and that's a big thing, you know, for me, is I never want to have any doubt whatsoever when I'm teaching to the youth, I'm up here, whatever the case is. There will be no doubt, or at least I don't want there to be any doubt, and if there is, please, come find me, that the entire time that I'm up here, it is based upon what the Word says. 
Okay, Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 says, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service and with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. The kingdom that we will inherit is stronger than any any structure that you can ever imagine. It will not it will not fall, it will not crumble. It is to be there forever and ever. Whenever you allow God to consume you, whenever you allow the example here, this fire to come upon you, you know, anybody who is, uh, I'm a massive fan of Forged in Fire on the History Channel. It's a show where they bring four blacksmiths together and through a series of challenges, they give them certain steels to mess with and they make knives out of them. And then they'll make historical weapons and things. But in order to make these knives and make them to where you can stab stuff with them, you can cut things with them, they have to put these knives in the fire. You can take that steel before you put it in the fire and you can bend it. It's malleable, you know, to a degree. But then once that, once that steel comes out of that fire and they quench it, it's no longer malleable. It's no longer being able to be moved. It is strong. So whenever the, whenever we're told that God is a consuming fire, well, we need to allow that fire to consume us so it can harden us so that we can have a firm foundation to understand the love we have for him. Because if we're standing on a shaky foundation, we can't be sure in the love we have for him because we don't know where we're standing to begin with. In Romans chapter 7, verse 13, it tells us that therefore did that which is good become a cause of death for me. May it never be. Rather, it was, a, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. So through the commandment, sin would become, would become utterly sinful. Deuteronomy tells us in chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. What does Jesus tell people whenever he's in his ministry? If you love me, you will follow my commandments. Do you think he come up with that all on his own? He had assistance. God has been commanding us forever to keep his commandments. Because if you're keeping his commandments, you're loving him. If you're loving him, you're keeping his commandments. They go hand in hand. It's like I've told the youth before. Uh, I've confused them before because I've told them, you know, when Jesus tells us, if you love me, you'll follow my commandments. Well, if we love him, we're following his commandments. If we're following his commandments, we're loving him. And I've confused them and had to sit here and have about a 20-minute conversation about, okay, do I follow his commandments to show him I love him, or do I love him to show him I can follow his commandments? And it can get quite confusing if you let it. But quite simply, it all comes down to love. What love are we showing him so that we can accept the love he shows us? Hello. Okay. Um, in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, 
The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. Do we really love God? The love we have for God can only be explained by the way we carry ourselves in our life. You know, we will inherit a kingdom that will never change. God is laying out a footprint for us to love him and giving us every opportunity to accomplish that love. You know, and it tells us he will delight in the fear of the Lord. That means it's exciting to love him. It's exciting to have that reverence for him because you know that as you carry that love and you carry that reverence, that we will begin to have that kingdom. When it's, all when it's all said and done. Because, because if we fear man over God, over God it's not, it's not going to turn out very good. If you, if fear, you the fear the Lord, Lord understand, understand that no matter, no matter what, what man does to you, that just that means, means that, that you get to see the Father faster. faster. Now, just now, like, just in, like in, in a lot of things, a things, lot of subjects, lot of subjects that you carry in the Bible, that you study, that you study. You know, there's you know, always there's always portions, portions of the Bible that, Bible that tells you, hey, hey, here's the here's good stuff. The good stuff. Then, there's also then there's also sections, sections of the Bible, of the Bible that, that tell you, tell you here, are here are consequences for certain actions. actions. Now, now do, do, do I do say, I say that, that those consequences... consequences Lead you, lead you out, out, out of salvation. Of salvation. No, I don't, no, I don't. I believe, I believe in what saved, always saved, but I do but believe, I believe that when we that stand before, before the judgment, the judgment seat, seat, we will be, we will required, be required to answer, to answer for, all for all of our actions. Our actions. And so, therefore, and so therefore, therefore, there's always there's sections, sections of the Bible that Bible tells you some consequences, which are sections of the Bible that are left alone by most of the people who read it because they know God as love. And they want to stay that way. Well, they don't understand that also love is rough sometimes. Love has instruction with it, and sometimes instruction isn't good. I do. I have a three-year-old at home. There's a lot of instruction that ain't very good, apparently. Or at least he don't think so. So, uh, so we're going to start in Galatians chapter 6. Verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Nor the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Where's your trust? Where's your love? Where's your focus? In Psalms 130, 3, 3 and 4, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Now is this, this is another example of fear in the word that comes to the idea, okay, does this tell us that we need to be scared of him? No, the, the reverence comes. Without, without him taking our iniquities away from us, if he was to mark those issues, if he was to mark those sins and remember them here, just like it says, who could stand? There's no way that we can live up to any expectation that the Father has for us without Him. There's no, no way 
that the expectations that he has for his followers we could we could stand up to without understanding without without turning to the salvation that he's given us through the death burial and resurrection in Luke chapter 4 verse 8 Jesus answered him it is written you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only you know there's certain there are certain sections of scripture that you read that really need no explanation. When I was reading this, as I was studying and finishing some stuff up yesterday, that's one of them. When the little red letters show up in your Bible, there's not a whole lot of explanation needed. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Now I know when I'm sitting here, when I'm up here, and I know, uh, you know, on Wednesdays, uh, I have a massive, massive amount of references. I want there to be no doubt where the message is coming from. That's, there's a a thought in some uh, in some sections where people figure we can make one or two verses and it covers what we need well anytime that I have any anything to say you know the word is absolute the word has tons of examples these are, I guarantee you, I'm just scratching the surface of the examples I'm giving you. There's no doubt about that. So in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, the conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments. Here we go again with keeping his commandments. Because this applies to every person. Once again, we have no list of requirements. We have not any goals that we have to meet. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. This is where I was kind of mentioning just a second ago, when we stand before the judgment seat, we're going to have to answer for all of our actions. In Hebrews chapter 10, Verses 29 through 31. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which we was sanctified, or he was sanctified, and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I don't know about you guys, but when I stand before the judgment seat, I don't want him standing up and slapping me around because that might hurt. When you, Whenever we stand before him, do we have the thought of I want him to tell me well done good and faithful servant or are we not worried about it enough to where you get nervous that he may say depart from me you worker of iniquities how much reverence do you have how much reverence do we have necessarily towards God to where that becomes a thought where we have an absolute fear of the Lord to where we don't get nervous about about seeing and hearing to depart when we stand before the judgment seat because we have such a reverence for him that everything that we do in life is to please him. 
All things we do here on earth will be brought before that judgment seat, lacking in fear and lacking the reverence that I'm talking about today can cause us to be deceived and it can begin allowing there to be a wedge driven between us and the Father. Discernment between understanding what the enemy is trying to tell you and what God's word tells us is something that's very important in today's society. If we, if we don't attempt to have that discernment to where we can tell when the enemy is coming after us and when God's word is correct. Well, let me rephrase that. God's word is always correct. But when we have that discernment between what the enemy is coming after us with or is it not the enemy coming after us? Because if we, if we allow ourselves to be deceived then we can let the enemy step in. And once you let the enemy step in and, you're, and you have to start fighting harder than you did, it can become overwhelming. You, know, you always want to put yourself in a position you know, to fact check whoever's up here, whoever... You know, if you're like me, I'm in my truck a lot, so there's a lot of a lot of podcasts and a lot of teachers that I listen to. You know, I have a group message uh, with some of the other youth pastors here in town, and and then uh, you know, with with Zach and Dwayne, to where if I ever hear something that's a little iffy, you know, I message all these guys. Hey guys, I heard this today. It's really interesting. But do we think that it's right? Accountability is something that I teach a lot. I try to tell all the youth, find some people that you can lean on and lean on those people. Don't ever be afraid to look for advice, to ask questions. You know, I just had, uh, I just had a couple that whenever they got back from Falls Creek, they told me, you know, that they had felt something pretty weird for a couple days. Didn't quite understand what it was. And they made a public rededication. And whenever they made that rededication, there was a overwhelming fear of, or overwhelming feeling of that weird thought and that weird feeling just went away. And they they had a, you could tell when we was talking, especially when I was taking notes about uh, Falls Creek, about you, about the camp and, and trying to kind of, uh, you know, feel them out as to what, what they learned and, and what they've retained and everything that that there was a little difference about them, you know. So, so under so having the thought of going public, having a public uh, a public confession of, you know, I'm not right in my walk is something that that a lot of people won't they won't do. They won't come public with anything because they're afraid that they're going to, one, be judged for it, or they're, two, I can fix it myself. You can't, you can't, you can't have that reverence and that love for God if there's something standing between you and God. If there is an event if there's a feeling, if there's a sin that keeps dragging itself behind you, it's attached to your ankle, that you can't have that reverence for him because you keep grabbing a hold of that. You know, finding someone who can help you can, can help you stay accountable, can help you fight that battle. They can help you to stay uh, to stay correct. 
there's an importance to this reverence and this fear of the Lord that, that these guys have been teaching here the last couple of weeks. Because if we're not taking the fear of the Lord seriously, then that transformation that that happens when you accept salvation hasn't fully happened. And we need to check ourselves to make to make sure why that hasn't happened. What is keeping me from making that transformation? You know, like I said, there's a lot of things that'll happen with, with some sports teams or whatever that that'll kind of cause some emotional roller coasters in my house. Not from my wife or kids, mainly just for me. But um but there's moments like that that it's like, okay, why am I showing this much emotion to these things that's going to perish eventually? Why do I need to, you know, there's something like, uh, you know, along with, uh, with football, you know, basketball and all them other sports, you know, I'm a huge NASCAR fan. And I come to a point here about five years ago that, you know, before that, on Sunday afternoon or Saturday night, depending on when the race was, hey, don't bother me. I'm going to be watching the race. That's what I'm going to be doing. Well, then I come to a point to where I was looking to get out, out of church by noon so I could get home. Okay, I got two minutes. But, you know, so I was focusing on that. I'd start looking at my watch. I'd start thinking, all right, hey, the race starts at 1, church gets over by 12, 12, 15, I get home, go grab something to eat, get in my chair, watch the race. So I, I personally had to come to a point of, wait a minute, hold on. And finally had one of those moments where I had to step back again. And finally understood that we have this great thing called technology in today's in today's world. So I can hit the record button. Okay. So what is there in your life that's pulling you away? That's that's driving that wedge between you and God. Is there an absolute reverence for Him to where we have the thought of? Every time before we do anything that I'm, am I doing this to please God? Is God pleased with me doing this? Is God pleased with the amount of time that I've spent with him? Maybe not, so I need to spend some more time with him. There's just, there's always a hunger. There's always a hunger that's involved to follow him. There's always a hunger that's involved to advance the relationship that you're in. So as as we end, just think, you know, maybe you got to take a moment and step back just like I've had to in the last couple weeks, you know, and go, wait a minute. I'm allowing this to drive a wedge between me and God. I'm trying, I'm allowing this to take the fear of the Lord that I've had and move it down the list to where I'm not solely focused on and what I'm... Is what I'm doing pleasing to him? You bow your head with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you praying that an absolute reverence for you would come upon us. Praying that whatever may be stopping us from having this reverence and having this thought of whatever I'm doing is it pleasing to you, Father? Whatever's driving that wedge, Father, that we would address it. Father, that we would not only pray to you, Father, but find someone to hold us, to hold us accountable, Father, someone that, that, that we can spiritually lean on to assist. 
Father, I thank you for everything that you do, everything you continue to do. There's blessings in our lives that, that we don't watch, that we don't see. There's blessings in our lives that, that we don't understand sometimes. Father, but one thing that I pray that we do know is that you are blessing us so that we can advance your word we can advance your kingdom in this world, Father. I thank you for everything that you do for this body. I thank you for everything that you do for the body of Christ in the world. Father, in this region, Lord, in this town, Father, that that the body of Christ would continue to stand, that we would stand up, Father, and take, take hold of, of the sword, Father, which is your word. Lord, the enemy is attacking us in ways that we've never had to had to deal with and never imagined probably that we had to deal with them in this way, Father. But I pray that, that we would learn through your word on how to address the new ways that the enemy is attacking us so that we could take the attack to him. Thank you, Father. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. If there's anything that that's driving you, driving a wedge that you need prayer for, please, I'm going to ask Zach to come up here. You know, please come up here and pray with one of us. Um, because that wedge, it'll stay there. It'll stay there until you pull it out. It ain't going nowhere. You are dismissed. <laughs>